And Lord, we do thank you again for all that you've done through your word. Speak to us this morning, great and mighty things that we know not of for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, continuing the life of David, now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah saying, is David not hiding in the hill of Hakalah opposite Jeshmon? They had done this back in chapter 23. The same thing. And what was hurtful is this is a part of David's family. It's his relatives. And they're betraying David to curry favor with Saul. And Saul loved it the time before. Well, it says in verse 2, Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000, notice this, chosen men. These are guys that... Uh, are superior soldiers, not just regular soldiers, but the elite 3,000 men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul encamped in the hill of Achaliah, which is opposite Jeshmon, by the road. And David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. So first it was sort of a rumor, um, and then it was verified that Saul has come out, and he's got 3,000 elite soldiers. David at this time has 600 mighty men, plus all their wives and kids and everything else, hiding out in these caves and these wilderness places. Very difficult. We can guesstimate that David was probably anointed as a young man to be king by Samuel, probably around 10 or so years earlier. And um, David, uh, is, it's been a difficult season on the move. Later, David would write, blessed is the man whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Going from cistern to cistern, through the valley of Baca, weeping. What does he say to do there in the Psalms? Let your tears make a well for the next guy traveling through. <laughs> and he can drink from that well. Your experience, your learning. Paul said, in the way I have been comforted in this time, being pushed above strength, beyond measure, despairing of life itself. I've received a comfort supernatural from God, but now I have an ability to comfort others who have gone through the same thing. Boy, I think of some of you guys this year from Reading who have lost your homes. People died. And then, of course, in a day and a half, the campfire spreading through paradise. We have many people here now living in Red Bluff, fellowshipping with us. And uh, you didn't choose the pilgrim as it chose you. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you're going to experience something in your lives that through this tragedy, that God's going to turn around for his good. And uh, in this time of your pilgrimage, your handful of clothes and new everything else, right? <laughs> lost it all in those fires. God's going to use that season in, in a unique way. Well, David was learning not through the comfort of a palace to be a king, but he was learning through difficulties, not just being burned out, if you would, but having to flee for his life, constantly looking over his shoulder if he's going to die today, if one of Saul's men is going to show up or somebody currying favor with Saul would shoot an arrow at him to gain favor. And so it goes on in verse 5 to say, So David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay and Abner, the son of Ner. The word in Hebrew for father is Abba. But if you put a part of that word in front of your dad's name, then it becomes the son of. So they didn't really know what to name Abner, so they just named him after his dad, a chip off the old block, the son of Nir. 
the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp with the people encamped all around him. So looking down at the group of 3,000 men, you would see a system of tents and fires encircling with hundreds of people on the outside going in and at the center core was Saul and all these 3,000 elite soldiers surrounding him. A rather good system, almost a perfect system. You're not gonna be able to get to the king. In verse six now, David answered and said to Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai, the son of Zariah, the brother of Joab. Take note of these guys, Abishai and Joab. They're gonna become the elite soldiers of David, generals in his army. Uh, but these guys, these two brothers, these sons of thunder, they only knew how to solve everything, you know, uh, by killing. That was it. Uh, fix that, I'll just go kill him. That's the answer for everything. Uh, and so anyway, these guys, these brothers who will go down, he said, who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I'll go down with you. Now this shows you how crazy these guys are. It's sort of like, David, you're going to go down in the camp and you want one other guy to go with you? Are you nuts? I mean, how do you, ex I mean, explain this. But Abishai's like, yeah, let's go. Man, interesting, isn't it? And so David and Abishai came to the people by night and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp. Now make a note in verse 12, just a second, we're going to see that they had through experience here, saw that God put them all into a supernatural sleep. It'll tell us that in verse 12. With his spear stuck in the ground by his head, and Abner and the people lay all around him. So David is sensing something from the Lord, like his kindred spirit, Jonathan. When Jonathan was laying there and and the Philistines were outnumbering them and the children of Israel were diminishing and, and Jonathan just has this spark in his heart that says, God is the decider of this battle. He doesn't even need one guy, but one guy could do it. And his armor bearer said, let's go, Jonathan. <laughs> and Jonathan starts heading towards the Philistines and then he's like, this is a little presumptuous. Lord, are you in this? If so, when I see the first Philistine, if he says, come up to me, that's a sign that you're going to give us victory. But if he says, wait, and I'll come down to you, we'll get back to camp. But sure enough, as we know, David and his armor bearer took on the Philistines and defeated the whole Philistine army. David here, probably much like the same sense of God speaking to his heart when Goliath came out. And David just had this heart of faith saying, this guy's blaspheming God and God's going to take him down. And uh, if nobody else is going to step up and let God use him, I'm ready. And he went and had great victory. So David goes down at night. And I could imagine him and Abishai stepping over bodies and, and, and trying to get closer and closer to Saul and, oh, kicks a pan over, makes a lot of noise. Uh -uh. Nobody moves. He gets a little quicker, a little closer and, you know, crunch, a limb breaks. He makes a step and steps right on the guy's hand. Ah, oh, we're in trouble now. Nobody's moving. And they finally get right up to Saul for everybody to know where Saul was, they put that giant spear of that giant man who was a head taller than everybody else right by his head to identify where he was. That spear. David knew that spear well, didn't he? He had it thrown at him more than once. He saw that spear that really couldn't be used by anybody smaller than Saul, and Saul was the biggest man of all. But we also saw Saul a few chapters back sitting royally under a Tinnabeth tree with his spear in his hand. It was a sign of pride and 
arrogance and and he was a man of the flesh and by his flesh he would rule. And this is why God disqualified him and gave it to one more worthy than him, his neighbor David. And so he's tiptoeing down. You know, it reminds me later when David's son Solomon would write, you can tell the, the heart of a man walking by faith and, and having a bravery in God and one not. He says in Proverbs 28.1. Do we have the verses going up today? Nope. Okay. Make sure you get on the app there to get the verses. Proverbs 28.1. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Isn't that great? David is going down. He's a righteous man, bold as a lion. Well, going on to 1 Samuel 26, 8. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let us strike him at once with the spear. Poetic justice, right? This spear you tried to kill me with, I killed you with your own spear. Right to the earth, I'll drive it. And I won't have to strike him twice a second time. Now, David, I, I, I know we had a conversation a while ago. The first time Saul had the armies coming out to chase us. And, and we all ran in the cave in En Gedi. If you go down to the Dead Sea there in En Gedi, as you're walking in through up and down these river dried riverbeds, there are hundreds of caves. They're amazing caves. You might remember this is where the Qumran scrolls, the greatest archaeological find, um, was found in one of those caves. But there was a lot of caves to choose from. And David and his 400 men at that time ran in and hid back in the back of a cave. And out of all the caves that Saul could have picked, to go in and go poo poo, um, he picked the exact same cave. And when you're coming out of that bright desert sun and walking into darkness, you can't see much. And so Saul walks in a little ways and, and, and there he spins around looking out of the cave and flips his robe back and, uh, and he's there and, and David's guys are far enough back going, this is the Lord. God has given your enemy into your hand. And, and it was hard for David going, there's no coincidences in the kingdom of God. <laughs> this this is, has to be a sign from the Lord. And, and there he is, perfect sword chopping head high, right there, you know? And, and, and this guy, Abishai, and the others are pushing him, pushing him. David, they, you know, all your woes are gonna be gone. And of course it would have been because David was the general of all generals in Israel. The people loved David. Saul killed his thousand, but David is tens of thousands. He was a great hero. But also Saul's own family loved David. Jonathan knew that David was going to be the next king. Loved him uh, like no other. And his Saul's foolish daughter, Michael, instead of bringing David down like Saul had predicted, David's character made her a wise woman. And she loved him as well. So David would have had no resistance had he cut that head off. But he steps forward and he's wrestling and wrestling and, and, and ready to, to do it. And he just instead goes down and chops a part of Saul's robe. And soon as he does it, he's, he knows in his heart, checking his spirit, oh, I just sinned against God by touching the Lord's anointed, just his robe, but that's too far, too much. And when Saul was at a distance, David came out and just, Saul, forgive me. I'm so sorry. I, I, I have touched your garment. I, I cut it and I, I'm, forgive me. 
And Saul says, I should have been dead. But David, you're a righteous man. And having spared my life this day, I know God's going to raise you up. And you are going to be the king. And when you become a king, be kind to my family. And so he said, I won't be doing this anymore, David. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, David would like to believe that. But uh, like police officers, you believe, but verify, right? Your high school kid says, believe me, I didn't do anything with that cell phone yet last night at two in the morning. Oh, I totally trust you. Can I have your cell phone? Don't you trust me? Yeah, I just want to prove to myself that I should have always trusted you. <laughs> trust, but verify. Well, David knew that Saul could be swayed by a fleshly um, wooing. And we're going to discover this guy, Abner, kept speaking into Saul's ear, paranoia, that this guy, David's going to take him down. Of course, he was going to lose his job. Well, David wrestled in that cave and he came out and he had that grief in his spirit and he knew this is not the way to go. And the next chapter, guys, you might remember, the cave was chapter 24. Chapter 25 was the Nabal story. Remember where this foolish man doesn't respect the Lord's anointed David, quite the opposite. He calls him a runaway slave and, and uh, totally disrespects him. And David's going to go and kill him. And, and, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, shows up and says, no, 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 David, you're a man who fights the Lord's battles. And, and don't, don't bring yourself down to kill this fool. You're going to be a great king. Everything God promised is going to happen. And when you're ruling on the throne, this act of killing this man and all his village is going to be a constant grief in your heart. You're going to look back and say, man, it was a great season going through that hard time in a cave. I wouldn't replace it with anything. But I've got the regret. And so David realized, oh my goodness, I, I'm not supposed to touch any anointed ones, including Nabal. This isn't, I, I don't need to protect me. I don't need to protect my anointedness. I don't need to protect my calling. If people want to completely disrespect me, God's going to have to sort it out. So David went back and it says, that the Lord killed Nabal. Disrespected the Lord's anointed. If you would, Nabal touched the Lord's anointed with his words, and that was enough. So David is learning the ways of God. He's lear learning the heart of God. He's learning the nature of God. And now as he comes to this scene, he knew that he knew, that he knew, I'm not going to die by the hand of Saul because God has made me the next king. And I am not afraid of Saul. And I'm not going down to kill him. I'm just sensing the Lord, like when he told me to go forward against Goliath, he's telling me to go forward to Saul. I don't know what this looks like. I don't know what this means, but I'm going. Is there anybody who wants to go with me? Abishai, yeah, I'm always ready to go. And so they start heading down. And there, as they finally get into that inner circle, and there is Saul snoring away, completely vulnerable for a warrior like Abishai, one movement pull the spear out of the ground. He would stab him in a perfect location. He would never awaken from his sleep. It would be merciful and painless. And, and David said to Abishai in verse 9, get this, this is important stuff. Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. So 
Just like Nabal, God will kill him if that's what God wants. Or he'll just die of old age, natural causes. Or he'll go out to battle and, and in battle, he'll be defeated and perish. The Lord forbid, in verse 11, that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let's go. Abishai says, David, 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 you don't get it. You don't get it. You're not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I am. <laughs> you're you're going to be free of this. You know, just give me a wink or, you know, just don't give me a negative sign. Just sort of shrug a little bit. Hey, you know, well, you know, whatever you think, I'm going to just go over here. And David says, no. You don't understand God. You don't understand his nature. You don't understand this very, very important principle. David says it this way in Psalms 105 verse 15. He says, do not touch my anointed ones, plural, and do not do my prophets no harm. David in Psalm 75, 67 says this, exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is judge who puts down one and exalts another. Do we get this? Boy, in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has this horrible dream and doesn't know what it means. And, and Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, pride is filling your heart because you're the greatest king that's ever lived. Your, your kingdom is a golden kingdom. It's an amazing kingdom. And that statue you saw was your pride. And you need to understand, <laughs> you're nothing before God. And Daniel says this in Daniel 2, verse 20 and 21. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his. He changes times and the seasons. Listen to this. He removes kings and he raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have no understanding. God can take a nobody and make him a king. He can take a complete fool and make him the wisest man in the world. God can take the wisest man in the world and make him a fool. God can take the greatest king that's ever existed and make him nothing. God is the one who raises up and brings down. And there is a deep work of the sovereignty of God that a believer would have faith that there is no authority in my life that God hasn't allowed to be there or maybe he has put him there. And God makes it clear. You know, we, we see all the way into the book of Acts where Herod arrested Peter and James and, and he killed James, beheaded him. He was gonna you know, not shoot all the fireworks off in one day. So the next day he was going to kill Peter. And Peter gets out of jail by an angel. And then it tells us two chapters later in Acts chapter 12, that Herod went down to a troubled area and he gave a speech and it was anointed. It was powerful. It was more than just a man. And Everybody was just in awe going, these are the perfect words to solve this problem. And it says, Herod received the praise to himself and God struck him with worms and he died. Interesting, this thing about authority. And David here is, is making it abundantly clear. <laughs> As the Lord lives, the Lord alone can take him off that throne. And if a man is doing this, he's going to be confronting the sovereignty of God. And I'm just telling you, as for me, I will never 
touch the anointed ones. In the New Testament, what are we, guys? We're kings and priests unto our God. The Lord has made it such for his delight. We are all the Lord's anointed. But yet in authority, you see in the home, the parents. Well, my parents are fools. You must be a teenager. <laughs> Yeah, it could be. But God has put you in this desert of your kinds of parents because he's changing you in this wilderness experience. Well, I got this teacher that it just is out for me, trying to make my life miserable because I'm a Christian. That's interesting. I've got a governor like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's why the Bible says you, in Second Tim or in 1 Timothy 2, you have a peaceable spirit with a quietness and pray for all those in authority all the way up to the King Supreme. Yep, God's using that person traversely in your life. But what you're going to learn is to come to the place like David, even if you had a foolish, evil king trying to destroy you, makes promises that he'll never chase you again. Come on home. You'll never hear another bad word against me. And he lies and keeps trying to kill him. It, it wouldn't matter how extreme it is. Paul says in Romans 13, Everybody in authority, the government of Rome, he says, is from God. And they're being used of by God to govern this. And you say, well, that's easy for Paul to say. He never had to live in California. <laughs> I think the Roman Empire was a little bit more difficult. The fact is, is it was an extreme society for Paul to say that. And if it applied to Paul and the Christians in Rome, it applies to all of us, doesn't it? And there, it's by faith. And, and David, it wasn't like angry at God that he couldn't kill his enemy. David is full of joy. That's what faith brings. Faith brings just a, a freedom of going, I'm casting these cares on God. It's God's problem. Well, what if Saul kills you? I guess God will have to raise me from the dead because he said I'm going to be king. Remember Abraham? When God said, okay, Abraham, slay your son Isaac. It tells us in Romans 4 and in Hebrews 11 that God had already let the cat out of the bag. He had said this one little phrase that Abraham caught, through Isaac your descendants shall be. So he was quite confident just to kill him because he, he knew, it tells us in Hebrews 11, that God would have raised him from the dead. He knew he wasn't going to ultimately murder his son. He knew his son was going to live. And he actually said to his servants, you guys stay here as he went up to Moriah, for I and the lad shall return. He knew it. David now has his faith going, I'm the Lord's anointed. I'm not going around telling people that and telling them to treat me that way. And you know, let me just give you a Bible study about talking to me that way. He, he, didn't, he didn't have to. He just could walk by faith going, God, you gave it. God, you'll protect it. And, and far as man, I'm going to love him, bless him, pray for him. I'm not going to fight for my authority. God's given it. And, and, and God's going to take care of that. And so he goes, man, I, I've seen it. When Nabal, I heard that Nabal was supernaturally killed by God. My heart, oh. The thought that I would have in my flesh tried to perfect what God was doing by his spirit and have not, I, I went down and killed Nabal and everybody in his, his, all the men in his village there, I would never have, seen 
and understood that God is taking care of those who disrespect me. I don't have to. Oh, and he died. It's like, wow. And now this situation. So we see David in the cave going, should I kill Saul? Should I not? Guys, you're making a good point. Just give me a second here. And David starts tiptoeing towards Saul. And he's just like, Lord, is this, is this, are they right? Are they, is he not right? I mean, is this why this thing happened? This supernatural thing? Saul picking the, <laughs> the same cave and not a very good cave system. Out of all the caves you could have picked, is it because you're wanting me to kill him? And, 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 and he just couldn't do it. And then when he cut his robe, he's like, oh, okay. I sinned by just touching his robe. Thank goodness I didn't touch his neck. <laughs> And then the Nabal story happened. Whatever confusion in this picture of trusting the Lord, it was cleared up, a little clear. And now David comes here and there's no waffling. There's no discussion to be had. God is in charge. He raises up and he'll do it when he wants to do it. And if he wants to do it today, then God can kill him just like he killed Nabal. Or maybe God's going to just let him live out to be 180 years old. And that's fine too. I, I, I'm not trying to negotiate my kingdom that I'm building, that I'm putting myself in this place of power and authority. It's God at work. And I, I can't just explain to you how joyful this is when we come to walk by faith in these things. And in 1 Samuel 26, 12 now, so David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head. They got away and no man saw or knew it or woke for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. And in verse 13 and 14, now David went over to the other side and stood on the top of the hill far off and a great distance being between them. David called out to the people and Abner, the son of Ner, saying, do you not answer Abner? And Abner answered and said, who are you calling out to the king? And David said to Abner, I'm not calling out to the king, I'm calling out to you. And you are, are you not a man? But see, Abner saw himself above David and, and who is this nobody calling out to him? And we see Abner saying, if you're addressing me, you're addressing the king. If you're, if you're uh, shouting at me, this is as disrespectful as if you were shouting at the king. And David says, no, it's not. It is not the same thing. Who is like you in Israel? Hands down, Abner was the greatest warrior, no doubt. He really was. Why then have you not guarded your Lord, the King? For one of the people came in to destroy your Lord, the King. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you to deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. It's the same thing, right? In time of war, <laughs> if you fall asleep at your post, that's a death penalty. And Abner, it was ultimately his responsibility all, over all 3,000 soldiers to make sure that the king was protected. Now, David doesn't get prideful and say, I just walked right by you and, you know, spit on your head and you didn't even know it. You know, he's not rude. He says, somebody went down there. And now see where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by your head. You know, Saul is like... I know I had my spear with me, didn't I? You know, it's like losing your car keys. What do you guys think here? Where could that spear have gone? And, and I know my jug of water looks like other people's, but I'm sure it was right here. Well, in verse 17, so Saul knew David's voice and said, is it your voice, my son, David? David said, it's my voice, my king, oh my, my Lord, O oh king. And he said, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done or what evil is in my hand? Now, therefore, please let my Lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is <clears throat> the children of men, may they be crushed before the Lord. For they have driven me out of this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. So now... Do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For 
the king of Israel, has come to seek a flea, and when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Notice how many times in verse 17 to 20, he says, my Lord, O king, my Lord, I'm your servant. My Lord, O king, I'm your servant. You are the king of Israel. We see David recognizing that God has raised him up and he is in that place of power and he is recognizing it as the hand of God that Saul is still the king and that he would not come against that ever. And he says, I'm just a flea. I'm like a guy chasing a partridge to kill it. A partridge is basically a walking or running bird, but when it has to, it'll fly a little tiny bit. It's like a pheasant. But after about the fifth time, it darts and flies a few feet, it gets exhausted, and literally the kid can just walk right up and pick it up or hit it with a stick. And David said, this is me. I got a flutter and get away from you. Flutter and get away from you. And I'm exhausted. My men are exhausted. Their families are exhausted. And, and they're saying, leave Israel. Remember, the Lord said, when you come into the promised land, you stay in the promised land. But I feel like I, I, I can't find peace in the land that God's given me as my inheritance. And the next thing, I'm going to fly across the border and go to where pagan gods are worshipped to find peace. That's what I'm afraid of. And in verse 21, then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David. I will harm you no more because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Now listen to these words. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Wow. It's the loving kindness and tender mercies of God that lead us to repentance. And often God shows his loving kindness and tender mercies through us, right? People see us, our works, and it says they see our good works and they glorify our, God, our Father in heaven. And here we see Saul making it clear. I, I just like to stop and to say, yeah, I'm David in this story. I'll tell you, I'm Saul. <laughs> I, I mean, aren't we all guilty of playing the fool and erring exceedingly? Matter of fact, Paul says it's sort of a precursor to be a Christian. In 1 Corinthians 1, he says, see your calling, brother, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God's chosen the, anybody? Yes. Foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. Boy, tr David later, when he was at sin against Bathsheba and he wrestled for almost a year, just falling apart, he finally got it. Healing didn't start, he said, until there was truth in the inward most parts. Sacrifice, I'll give it. Offerings, I'll give them. What do you want? And God says, I don't want your offerings. I don't want your sacrifices. I want truth in the inward most parts. And by David's being like Jesus, I would just say, brought Saul to say, I see myself because of what you've done. Well, finishing up here this morning, verse 22 to 25, David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Now listen to verse 24. And indeed, <clears throat> as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in, not your eyes, Saul, but may my life be valued in what? The eyes of the Lord. Let him deliver me out of all tribulation. And Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son, David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. 
So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. David says, out of this experience here, Saul, here's what I want. I want God to calculate out my attitude, my heart, my actions towards you. And when I'm playing the fool and erring exceedingly, that God will look at me and have mercy on me exactly the way I've treated you, Saul. And Saul says, amen to that, David. I do think that God is going to judge you the way you've judged me, which was no judgment at all, right? Well, finishing up in Luke 6, verse 35 to 38, Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, says, love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return. Not just, well, you didn't give anything back, I'll just let it go. No, hoping that he just receives it as a gift and doesn't feel like he has to give anything back. And your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to who? The unthankful and the evil. For God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful as your father also is merciful. Judge not and you'll not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put in your bosom. For at the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. We see David, don't we? He got it. He got the heart of God. He revealed to us Jesus in the Old Testament. How we have all played the fool and erred exceedingly. And Jesus took all our foolishness, all our sin on the cross. And what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're just playing the fool. And I ask that you won't judge them for being so fleshly, sinful, greedy, lustful, angry, and just love them. And let my blood take away all their sin. Amen. Lord, we thank you as we go line upon line, precept upon precept, learning why David is this man after your own heart, that you would do a great, great work in our lives. We know today these are spiritual principles that your mind, that your heart, that by your spirit, you have to bring to our mind at times of need because we can't always see our situation so clearly. So let us hide now this morning your word in our heart that we would not in the future sin against you. And we thank you again for leading us to the still waters and the green pastures this day. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you all.